Hello, everybody, and welcome to the third ever Web3T live streamed YouTube episode, webisode, webisode, whatever it's called. Um, you know, I've got uh, very exciting guests again. I don't know how I keep getting these guests, but we've got Matt Bartlett, um, the director of Web3 and NFT community at Van Eck. And then we have Matthew Siegel, who is the director of digital assets research. Is that right, Matt? Research, digital asset research. You're the director of something in the digital asset space at Van Eck. And I think the way I think about Matt Siegel is the first time I ever talked to him, I had put together a deck for something I was working on related to digital assets. This is about, what, a year and a half, a year ago or so. And I kind of showed it to him to say, hey, what do you think? And he, he didn't give me any big, big comments, but the conversation that we had, I immediately emailed uh, Jan Van Eck, our CEO, and said, really impressed, great hire. So I, 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 I thought of it like, you blew my mind. You blew my mind during that first call, and I appreciate it. So I'm expecting you to do that today again. Um, so yeah. No pressure. Do you have anything to say? Any, anybody anybody want to follow up on that amazing inter, uh, intro? So I did nothing and that impressed you. It sounds like a low. <laughs> no, 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 no. JP. The substance. Well, no, no. You didn't get you, you did. So I've sent you a couple things that, and I, I get the sense that you don't like to make big edits on other people's work. I think that you, you know, there are people when you send them stuff, they want to change everything. And, change, and you, you're kind of like, if you're on the right track, you're not going to make a lot of edits right you know like you're on the right track it's your thing trend so following I, I can appre i can appreciate that too so um the but what you t we talked about audius we talked about audius in that conversation i had never heard about audius and it was really cool so there you go that's my uh flowery introduction to to matt siegel all right let's get right into it guys let's get right into it. we got a big show today we're gonna talk about uh some updates to the NFT, the Vanek Community NFT. We've got a big reveal coming out, I want to say May 31st. Is right. that right, Matt? Yeah. So on May 31st, the, your NFTs are going to transition into the actual 3D avatars, which are going to be awesome. We're not going to reveal the avatars today. We are going to show video two, episode two of the Hammy series. Um, I'm going to ask Matt some questions about what's going on in the NFT world, what projects he's like, not liking, what projects he's following, what's happened this, in the past week, interesting stuff. And then we're going to turn it over to Matt Siegel, and he's going to run through some slides, which I have seen, and um, I'm excited to share them with everybody. So, Matt Bartlett, yep. without further ado, three minutes in, take it away. Awesome. What do we got? So, yeah, just a light refresher on the project to start, where it stands. We did a, a May 2nd was sort of the launch. We introduced you to the, uh, the base character, Hammy. And then on the 31st, as JP just said, we're going to have the reveal. And, and I will share some full PFP pictures later on in, in Twitter uh, following this so folks can get a better idea of what they're going to have in their wallets next week. Uh, but, you know, that first video that we shared a couple weeks ago sort of left with a cliffhanger, right? And so we're going to jump into the, the second video. JP, if you could pull that up. This is going to sort of yeah. tease the reveal of the other characters alongside Hammy. So I'll, I'll let you... Uh, take over the, the tech work there. Yeah, Eagle, your face, your face got weird, Eagle, but whatever. All right, we're gonna run it. We're gonna watch this video and then we're gonna talk about it. Hold on, it's, it, it didn't play right off the bat. Hold on, hold on. Amazing. All right, let me turn over that yeah. stuff. So, here. look, I think there's a lot more Easter eggs in this one than probably the first. Um, 
I don't know if you want to maybe queue up a couple of the of the slides or not, JP, or just talk to them, right? Walking in and seeing some of the images. Yeah, let's not get into it. So, okay, so the, what's the title of this episode, Matt? What's Corsica. the title of this episode? Okay, so Corsica. So, so something to kind of keep in mind as we, you know, reveal this video and the next video, and then as we get into the kind of 101s, you know, we're trying to build lore here, right? We're trying to kind of tie, again, Vanek to Alexander Hamilton to a history of innovation and, and forward thinking, right? And so uh, Corsica refers to uh, Alexander Hamilton's militia that he created in 1775 here in New York City. Um, and he, he created it as a group of students from King's College, which is now known as Columbia University. Um, you know, so Hamilton was in there. Um, and Hamilton, I don't know, for those of you who care about history, Hamilton went on to become George Washington's right-hand man. He was his, like, chief aide, right? So even though Hamilton was never a president, um, he, he, had, he, he was a huge founding father, right? And so he, and he actively participated in the Revolutionary War. Maybe not in a, uh, you know, pick up your musket and charge across the field way, but in a strategic, tactical, um, you know, George Washington's right-hand man. I, I want to say, you know, his, the book that came out that the, the play was based, or the musical was based on, really gets into a lot of details on the stuff that he was doing. And really, Hamilton had full, uh, he had full authority to write letters in, in George Washington's name and give orders to say, hey, guys, send this there. We need to do this. So he was a voice and a right-hand man for George Washington in ways that I don't, I don't think people fully understand at this point. Backing up a step, Corsica was his militia that he created in 1775. Tying it to this video is, at the end of the video, Hamilton is creating this team, right? So we're mimicking the Corsica militia experience in the NFT video. And what's going to happen next week is, for those people who are, uh, you know, got the NFT, is you're going to reveal a character that is a member of this Corsica squad that we've kind of created with our NFT partners, Numomo. So that that's kind of the backstory. I don't know, Matt. Is there anything you want to add or yeah, focus on? Yeah, and that's why we wanted to tie the the reveal to this video. Um, you know, the the characters that will that are more of the rare characters are are sort of you kind of saw their faces briefly in that video. Uh, but then I think it's also worth mentioning too that when it comes to rarity, we we sort of hate this idea of of a common, you know, uh, a character class. Uh, there's really nothing common about these characters or what we're doing. So, as the avatars reveal, there will be a a, a class called the Guardians, which will be the ones with no masks. You'll see their faces, and the others with masks will be called Scouts. So um, that's what's going to happen next week. And then the more legendary one of ones that, that we've teased, those will reveal at a later date. So more to come there. Um, great. Well, I mean. So Hamilton was pro-Central Bank, right? He, he was, you know, the founder yes. of the Central Bank. So he, he would be disappointed at, at what the esteemed institution has turned into today. Is that the, is that the narrative here? That's the 100% vibe. Uh, Matt, you know, and that's the thing, like, right, and I think the, the, the trick is, yes, he'd be disappointed in where we are now, but it's like, okay, we can sit around and cry about it, or we can come up with a solution, yeah. right, like, and so for Hamilton, it was like, nobody believes in the full faith and credit of the United States government or their bonds, they're worth nothing, that is what it is, what are we going to do about it to fix it, right, so we, and I'm sure you can, you know, you, we see Bitcoin, and the broader digital asset landscape as a kind of same thing of it is, is an innovation that's forward looking, that's helping to uh, create a new framework for people to move forward and, and grow versus having, you know, what we have now centralized fiat currency. I don't know. You want to riff on that for a second? Well, would, yeah. Mm -hmm. Whoever the central banker is in America's future who decides to add Bitcoin to the U.S. reserves, right, that will be the forward thinker who says, look, the full faith and credit of the U.S. is under threat, and the way to reassert it is by, you know, grabbing some of that hard money. Uh, so I think that's what we're that's what we're going here for, right, is if Hamilton knew about Bitcoin and watched what the Fed had done, he would be a first mover. So you think, do you really think that the U.S. government, now this is pure speculation, obviously, not not financial advice, whatever. Do you think the U.S. government is going to actually, like, incorporate Bitcoin? Not not U.S., not U.S., you know, 
digital currency, not USDC, but actual Bitcoin into a balance sheet somehow or, you know, integrate it into the financial system? I do. I think that the states and the local governments will begin to do that. Uh, and then eventually, right, we might be talking decades down the road, uh, G7s will, will hold Bitcoin as reserves, yes. You think? What? Bitcoin as a reserve currency. Now, do you think that eventually, in, the, in our lifetime, that fiat currency as we know it, US dollar, euro, whatever, will lose significant market share to Bitcoin? Like actual Bitcoin, not like a, you know, an, another coin, like as a means of currency? Like, do you foresee that in our lifetime? Yes. Uh, but I, I think, you know, each nation will still have their fiat yeah. uh, and the value of that fiat will fluctuate as it always does based on the productivity of, of the country behind it, right? How big is their army? How fast is their population growing? And how strong are their institutions? And what are the assets that are backing that fiat, right? And so the, the faster uh, those, any country is to, uh, you know, adopt hard money, provide confidence to the market, the more that country should outperform long term. Now, I, we've totally gone off script here, Matt. Oh, good. good. <laughs> uh, both, I got two Matt. I got two Matts on the show. Um, we, we totally got off script, but you, you, I'm leading to a lot. This is generating questions for me. And the next question is, okay, so I'm, we wrote that crypto predictions blog earlier this, you know, end of last year, right? And one of the predictions was there's going to be more emerging markets adoption of Bitcoin as a, you know, as a official means of payment or currency, right? Which is what we saw in El Salvador. And then another one happened too, right? Paraguay, or is it about to happen? Central African finalized? Republic, actually. So this is a, okay. yeah, it's an African nation. It's one of 15 countries that still use the CFA franc, which is the last colonial currency still in existence. Uh, so these guys, Central African Republic, it's the sixth poorest country in the world. They share a monetary policy with the richest country in the world, Luxembourg. Uh, you know, that's uh, not sustainable. Uh, and the, this country still has to put 50% of their foreign exchange reserves at the Bank de France, who has veto power over how they spend it. So it's an incredible loss of sovereignty, right? When these countries are negotiating with the IMF and there's about 5% of the world who's, who's in default and negotiating with the IMF at any given point, and they go into these negotiations and the IMF asks for tough compromises and it inevitably causes conflict in these countries right civil wars even that's what happened in el salvador they had a civil war and then they had to adopt the dollar uh, and uh you know these countries like central african republic see bitcoin as an end around uh, it's a way that they can use uh, their energy resources that you know the close to the equator they have plenty of solar uh you know mine some bitcoin and now they've got some sovereignty over their money supply and uh you know that we think some percentage of the five percent who are in default in any given point are going to look to bitcoin as a as a as a tool of leverage to negotiate versus the imf and some of them will actually choose to adopt it and you know what strikes me on that conversation is that it's again it's all tied to geopolitical historical economic forces that are shaping the lives of people in these individual countries, right? Just like what was happening back in the 1700s when Alexander Hamilton did this thing, right? So that's what I'm really, I'm, I, maybe I'm overdoing it, but I'm really trying to create this thread from the past to the present to the future. And when you're talking about this kind of stuff, you know, the the, the last colonial currency, I mean, like, that's ridiculous. Like, that the people are still, people in Central Africa, they're, they're you know, monetary policy of their fortune is tied to luxembourg like how so not what, only where, can what this is... country not devalue if they want to right because they're tied to the euro but they also have signed these cooperation agreements with france over the decades that they're forced to do where their exports france has right of first refusal to buy their exports so the country gets really trapped right and france has intervened in this region dozens of times in the last 50 years to try to preserve the status quo and it's it's not preservable anymore so for so the way i see when i hear you talk about this so right now it's a tool or a potential like tool for countries that are kind of having a hard time right you're not going to see the united states do this or france do this or whatever somebody who's doing okay do this until their backs against the wall is that how you kind of see it for right now yeah 
Okay, cool. Wow. Um, okay, that's like a little preview, a little sidewinder yeah. preview. Let's go back to NFTs for one second, and then we'll flip it back, and we'll let we'll give Siegel. Uh, uh, we're gonna pull up some slides, and we're gonna run them. Um, so Matt, why don't you talk about the the open sea? Why don't you give that? Yeah, run yeah, down? sure. So, you know, we mentioned last last YouTube show. You know, we're doing something that hasn't been done. The, the first global asset manager to launch an NFT and. You know, we're, we are running into certain challenges, right? And we want to be transparent uh, to our community regarding those. So one has been that you know we're we're not we're still not going to verify an open scene, but so many of the of the most popular DApps out there pull in their API from OpenSea. So I, I know that question is still lingering for many of our NFT holders of like, hey, what happened to my NFT? I saw it in my wallet. Now it's gone. It was on Rainbow.me. Now it's gone. It's still there, not right. I mean, it's it's on the blockchain. It's still there. But where you can go right now, um, a couple ideas. DapRadar.com is similar to Rainbow.me, meaning that you could paste your public Ethereum address in there and see the assets that that you own. Looks Rare, which is another secondary market. So again, don't buy, sell, or list your NFT, but you could see your assets on LooksRare.org. Uh, and then one of our community members earlier today on Twitter mentioned they could see it in their coin in their Coinbase wallet. So so that is still there. Um, we're still working through it. I mean, if that's it, that's it. But hopefully we we could uh, we could have it available on more more applications. Yeah, and so I use Coinbase wallet and I can see it in my Coinbase wallet. And I also have OpenSea and I can't see it in OpenSea. So feel your pain. You know, OpenSea is kind of like the 500 pound gorilla in the room. So they kind of set. What they do has downstream effects, right? Just like the rainbow me dot example. So, um, but be rest assured, you know, the NFTs do exist on the blockchain and that's the beauty of it. OpenSea doesn't control what happens right. on the blockchain, right? There may be a mechanism to get in and view the uh, blockchain, but they don't control it. They, can, they can't take away your NFT if you were given one. It's your wallet, it's your NFT, right? So that's cool. And what we're doing here is illustrating in real life kind of some of the things that are going on there through real world examples and use cases, which was the point the whole time. Yeah. So if you're watching this, I, I, I have a feeling that most people watching this ha already have a wallet, but if you're watching this and you're like, well, I don't know what you guys are talking about, download, download Coinbase wallet, download Trust wallet. Matt wrote a great how-to. Do, just do something to get your feet in the water because the crypto markets, in, I would say, is in a bear market right now. And do you want to be getting involved during? Uh, what makes you, know, you say that, uh, JP? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's some of your because I've seen your I, I've seen your slides. What you know? Do you want to be getting involved when everybody's talking about it in McDonald's? You know, and the whole line is talking about NFTs, or do you want to get involved uh, potentially early at um, I would say more compelling valuation levels for some of this stuff? Yeah. Yeah. All right. If, Let's if, flip to the giveaway. Put, um, yeah, go ahead. One you know, event that I wanted to tout just while we're still on that. Um, I put out on Twitter that on June 10th in Austin, Texas, we're going to be hosting uh, a reception with uh, Cynthia Lummis, who, who's a, a Wyoming U.S. Senator, an advocate for Bitcoin. So she's going to be there to, to speak. But honestly, it's, I think it's what, like a two and a half hour reception, cocktail reception. So you'll have a chance to meet industry leaders, meet us. Meet us. I mean, I mean, yeah, we're, we're obviously about a big draw leaders. for that. Um, so if you would like a ticket to that, you're, if you're going to be at Consensus, just email us uh, uh, nft at vanag.com and we'll, and we'll, uh, we'll get you squared away. Yeah, cool. All right, let's, All right, let's flip it. Let's, let's give away an NFT. What do you think, Matt? Uh, and and what, we did, what we did last time was we asked a question, historically based, uh, was, the answer was Ben Franklin, and everybody was saying Hamilton in the chat. It's like, are you guys even listening, right? So uh, because, you know, Matt, it's Matt Siegel's first time on the show, we asked him if he could come up with a question, and he did. It's a good one. So the first person who answers this question correctly in the chat, you can email the nft at vanak.com that, you know, I'm the right person, and, if, you know, verify, you know, screen, screenshot your username or something like that so we know it was actually you. And then away we go. So I'm, I'll be watching the chat. Hold on, let me pull up my chat. Austin, why not Houston? Because that's where the that's where the that's where consensus is. Um, so for all the people asking how to get an NFT, the answer is to answer this correct correct answer this question correctly first. Go. Is that for me? Yeah. Okay, folks. Here's the trivia question: uh, Who is the first musical artist to ever accept? 
Bitcoin for his work or her work. First musical artist to accept Bitcoin for their work. Any guesses? Do, 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 do. I don't I'll see any guesses. If someone gives this quickly. So, well, there's a bunch of people Googling right now. The chat's just talking to themselves. <laughs> somebody just said, somebody just said, please. Right. I mean, you could be, I need to win. Ax, Axios, if you need to win, I mean, Do you can work. Google. We'll give a hint here. Yeah, this this is... musical artist uh, has. Uh, oh, we got okay. one. We got one. Mr. Q said 50 cent. But <laughs> well, yes, Mr. Q, I know. We got you. Uh, Mr. Q. Congratulations wow. and welcome to the Vanek community. Send an email to um, not one reply. You guys, okay, it's up. No, no. Uh, Mr. Q, send us an email, nft at and we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll need your ETH address and then we'll send you an NFT. So thanks for playing, guys. Good, good job, everybody. Awesome. Rapper Money Man, next one. Okay, so. All right. Um, we talked about consensus. We talked about NFTs. We're about 21 minutes. I think we're moving them right along. So last part for you, Matt, before I pull you off stage. Um, you know, what, what's what's an NFT pro? What, what happened this week? You know, what's going on out there in the NFT world that you're seeing as somebody who's like really digging into this yeah. stuff? And we're, we're, what's going on out there? Uh, okay, so so there is one project in particular. I do own this one, so not financial advice, etc. Um, but it's just a really innovative business model. So. It's called the Board Box by Board Elon Musk, who's a pseudonymous Twitter personality with, I think, over 1.7 million followers. So Board is selling a box of five play-to-earn assets that he's curated on his own so that sort of the initial value add is that the gamers out there could spend a lot more time playing games and, and not searching for which game to play next. So this project's attempting to sort of spoon feed its users with the best experience based on his knowledge of the industry, right? But what I think the brilliance is of the business model is that because play to earn game producers really aren't focused on the, the community out there that's just looking to flip assets, um, it, it, he's really taking advantage of finding this, this, this group of web three crypto native people who know how to connect a wallet but they also love video games, right? And so he's curated this list that's really quite valuable to game makers since that's their target audience. So he's bringing users to their platform who could then engage and then maybe mint more of their NFTs tied to that project. So it's it's a, it's really smart on both ends. And uh, I think he, he sort of uh, hit a home run, especially with some of the assets that were in the box. So, uh, oh, I mean, what, one, one extra point on that is once you open the box and you get the assets, that box becomes a mint pass for all future boxes. So that's a that's another advantage. Yeah, I was gonna bring that up. So uh, you know, sometimes you'll you'll get it's like a loot box, right? Like you don't know what's in it when you when you when you buy it as an NFT, and then the box opens, and then the box disappears or gets burned, and then you get whatever's in the box. In this case, once the box opens, you get to keep it, and then it's gonna be filled you know if you want to mint it's going to give you that essentially it's like a whitelist card that you're using for future mints for that project it was really cool and i'll just add a big shout out to my uh to my mom Catherine lee aka jip lee is her uh, uh username my mom is how old is she she was born in 1947 so she's 75 years old this year my mom had some had like a little bit of money on uh, coinbase pro and she had a little bit of money in coinbase she did a transaction, Bitcoin to ETH. She she sent herself to her new wallet, ETH from one. And then she sent herself, so she did two different transactions to get the ETH into her wallet. You know, she downloaded uh, MetaMask onto her browser. She minted one of these boxes, so right? So how many, here's a, here's a question. How many 75 year old women own an NFT where they actually did the transaction themselves? I was helping her, but she did it. I mean, it's got to be. Sounds like a less. like a future guest on the show to me. I yeah, I was thinking go. I was thinking we could have a mom's episode that I think would be really funny if we brought on like people, you know, like have the person, you know, have the guest and then their mom. I think that would be good. But you know, we just miss Mother's Day, so maybe next year. Um, I don't know, but that's cool. I just wanted to bring that up. Shout out to cool. to my mom. She's a cool lady. Um, all right, so. I think it's time to kind of switch gears 
and let um, you know let Siegel do his thing and run through some slides. Siegel, I'm gonna interrupt you. I'm gonna you know I told you know we're gonna interrupt you. We're gonna we're gonna shout out questions because a lot of this stuff is thought provoking. I feel like and it deserves conversation and so that's what we're here to do. All right, so this is gonna take me a second. And we're gonna I'm gonna mess up my screen here, so just be ready. I gotta share my screen so you can see it. PowerPoint presentation, start sharing, and now I'm gonna bring, so you guys, yep. can you see my screen, guys? All right, so I'm gonna switch to this other window. We're all there, I gotta fix my face, hold on. Uh, Seagull's face disappeared, perfect. It's just what we like to see. It's live TV, folks. Live TV, all right, Seagull, I'm gonna bring you back. Um, give me one sec, Seagull. You're like a New York one. And... Exactly. And I'm doing it live. I'm doing it live. And I mean, to be honest, the content's unmatched right now. So, you know, I'm a content producer first and foremost. All right, so here's your face, you're back. All right, here we go. All right, you can get you set up here, get you a little smaller, you're a little too big. And then. So, can I set, you want me to set the stage here? Yeah, set the stage. You set the stage yeah. and then we'll so, get it. So, it. I just got back from. Uh, a week in Europe uh, marketing. Vanek has 19 different crypto funds now, so we had to get out and. Which we're not going to talk about. Which we're not going to talk about any funds I'm or name any funds. There's 19 funds, uh, and okay. we had to get out and, and educate institutional investors in Europe uh, about all of our offerings. And I, I did 32 meetings and met, you know, a couple hundred people. And the sentiment is really bad, right? And you can see it in the price action. Um, the layer ones are down, you know, 40 to 60 percent this month, and everyone is, you know, maniacally focused on inflation as this permanent situation. And, you know, I think our house view at, at Van Eck, we're also worried. We've been right about inflation. Uh, we were like underweight growth, overweight commodities. Uh, and so it was a good call, but when it, whenever the sentiment is really one-sided, uh, I just want to explore the alternative. So, so this is what um, you know, Twitter, uh, crypto Twitter, and kind of re now retail investors are freaking out about, which is the price of Campbell's soup going parabolic, and the price of air, which used to be free, and, and now you got to pay you know two bucks to fill up your tires. So, um, <laughs> you know, and and that's been that's been dragging on crypto prices because um, crypto is a long duration growthy asset class and if you run the cash flows on many of these projects they're they're pretty low which means that inflation rates and discount rates can can play a huge role um, next slide how, how did we miss the opportunity to in, sell air for a living that, that seems like yeah a seriously wow well, those machines cost yeah. money. First of all, those machines—it's not like it's not like this is a machine. But you, we were talking about before the show, real quick. So there's a meme out there in the internet, and if you look at a lot of different charts, this is a chart of Campbell's soup. There are other charts. Uh, I don't have any off the top. Probably college tuition. Something happened in 1971, and 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 there's all this debate about what happened, but something changed. I don't know what it is. What what changed in 1971? Do you know? Siegel, I mean, like, do you have an answer to that? Uh, does it have something to do with the gold standard, maybe? That's that's kind of like, is that the year that it flipped? Yeah, August fifteenth, yes. nineteen so seventy-one, that... when President Nixon announced that the U.S. would no longer convert convert dollars to gold at the fixed value of thirty-five dollars per ounce, uh, and that was beginning of an incredible decade for gold and gold mining stocks. It made this firm, right, Jan's dad. Uh, yes turned all of his international mutual fund into gold mining stocks. And uh, if you look back at a lot of things, right, U.S. birth rate, uh, blue collar wages, a uh, whole, whole bunch of series that were heading in the right direction in the early 70s started to head in, in the wrong direction. And it was, in many people's views, the beginning of the perversion of, of institutions in order to justify this uh, fiat standard, which, uh, you know, started to make not too much sense. Right. All right. All right. So, so here, um, you know, just to hammer home the point of how negative everyone is, and, and maybe they should be negative, right? So this is a measure of real liquidity. Uh, it's M2 plus equity, bond, ETFs, and mutual funds, uh, and then you subtract industrial production. 
So this will capture times when the real economy uh, is doing okay, as it is now, right? We're reopening from COVID. Everyone who is flying around the world on, on airplanes, of course, for leisure, not for work, because people don't want to work. Uh, but we're, we're at the point here um, where real liquidity is quite contractionary. Uh, and we're getting close to kind of 2009, 1994, 1974 levels. And, and these are periods that are associated with pretty bad bear markets. Uh, but then you can see from this series that, uh, that there's always a new narrative around the corner. We're never quite sure how it's going to happen, but things don't tend to linger in uh, this kind of extreme negativity for, for very long. Next slide. Okay, so what? So and, and, and we're starting to see uh, some evidence that at least on a on a second derivative basis, uh, inflation may be rolling over. Stock market's acting a little bit better this week. So here you see a five-year inflation break-evens, ten-year inflation break-evens, uh, peaking at the beginning of this month and and starting to roll over. Uh, and if we want to take the positive view that uh, inflation is the consensus trade and uh, you know, growth is going to start to work a little bit better, uh, at least in relative terms, then these are some of the series that we may be watching to try to call a turn in crypto as well. So break evens falling and then this call out from Hilton, right? Over the last six months, we've seen a very significant increase in labor coming back to the labor force. And if you listen to what the Fed is saying, they want to tighten financial conditions. Uh, they want people's savings to evaporate so that they're forced to go back to work. Uh, and that is what is happening. If you go to the next slide. Yeah, that that's so the savings rate went crazy in COVID, right? Like, it, it, yeah, we got a new a new print today. And it was uh, it's I think it's back to let's see here, US savings rate. Uh, anyway, it plummeted. Uh, it was out today. So so here here you can see the top right chart uh, workers are returning to the labor force. Remember that great resignation? Yeah, that that was when people thought that their board apes were worth, uh, you know, millions of dollars, not hundreds of thousands of dollars. So uh, the new the new uh, trend is work to earn, um, not play to earn. And you can see that with people coming back to the workforce and then the bottom right chart, which is wage trends by education. So one of the big um, kind of changes in trend that we saw on the tail end of the of the Trump presidency was uh, bigger wage gains by blue collar workers that accelerated during COVID. Uh, there was a shortage, uh, but over the last three, four quarters, it's really started to, to decelerate. Um, so both um, kind of college educated and high school educated workers now seeing negative uh, real wage growth, uh, and that should you know, continue to bring people back to the workforce. Uh, and then I just highlight this uh, very narrow gap between births and deaths. So the, the demographic situation is nothing like it was in the 1970s. Remember the call there was uh, that global population is exploding. We're going to run out of food. Of course, that didn't happen because technology saved the day. Um, but we're, it's just a very different picture right now. And, and once we get this uh, you know, pig through the python of inflation, it's possible that we go back to this long-term uh, deflationary trend. Did you see the thing where Musk, in the, like in the last week, Elon Musk said some comment, and he was like, people are focused on the wrong thing. We should be focused on population growth. And that it's, be, you know, the, I think people around, you know, in the in developed world are worried about overpopulation. And then some people out there, like Elon Musk, is like, well, you guys are looking at this the wrong way. It's, we're actually, the, the risk is coming from the opposite direction, right? So that, I thought that was an interesting. Yeah. You got any thoughts on that? Well, just, kinda, I'm going to try that? and link this all uh, to, to crypto, um, which is uh, one of the drivers of the disinflationary trend over the last couple of decades has been automation and robotics and software. And if anything, you know, these trends are getting accelerated by, by inflation. Uh, and crypto and, and blockchain technologies, the way that they allow uh, strangers globally to coordinate on financial issues, cultural issues, set up new organizations, um, you know, that's a continuation of this disinflationary automation trend. Uh, and I think you'll see, you know, over the long run, as as this kind of disinflationary trend reemerges, uh, you know, blockchain will be one of the reasons why. 
Um, and that's that's kind of, that's just the, your comments right there. Deflationary technology. That's what um, Kathy Wood kind of aligns. You know, that's what her thinking aligns with. And I see, I, I saw an article today, Forbes or New York Mag, New York Mag had some, you know, article bashing Kathy Wood, and it's just like I just don't get it. Like um, the trend, the trend for deflation related technology, technology and AI and stuff like that is pretty apparent to people who like dig into it. And it's just like such a thing with the narrative. And you don't have this slide now, but you used to have a really good slide about media narrative, right? Where the media narrative is this, but if you dig into the primary data you might find something different, right? So like that's, a, I think, an ethos that crypto has. It. Do your own research, right? F like figure this out for yourself. And it, and that, I think that's what we're all kind of doing here. All right, cool, 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 cool. Next all right, thing. but so meanwhile, a as the world worries about inflation, uh, markets are, you know, really punishing growthy, growthy asset classes, growthy equities. So this is year-to-date returns. Uh, S&P down 17, China's down 19. It's pretty amazing that the long bond ETF, TLT, which everyone was, you know, that's supposed to be the safety asset, that's down 21%. So incredible, just capital destruction going on, you know, equities, fixed income, and yes, crypto, uh, Bitcoin down 38, Ethereum down 48. Uh, and then I, I just use Shopify as an example of kind of a, a you know, very growthy, uh, theoretically high margin, but actually low profit software platform company. So, you know, quite similar to Ethereum in that regard uh, and down 75%. So plenty, plenty of stuff's gotten taken out, not just crypto. Uh, if you go to the next chart, it's really an eye chart. Uh, and I'll just kind of explain what's what's going on here with, with volatility, where basically um, Ethereum and, and Bitcoin volatility are at like two year lows and NASDAQ uh, volatility and S&P is at two year highs. And like Shopify on this, we could have used a particular ETF company that you mentioned as a proxy for this, but I'm using Shopify instead. But um, these like really innovation focused uh, growthy companies, um, if they can make it through the other side of this growth slowdown, you know, without needing financing and going bankrupt, uh, uh, th those types of assets are, are printing ball above 100%, right? So it's, uh, crypto's not unique in this environment. And I just wanted to throw this really complicated eye chart out there to give you conviction in that point. I mean, Bitcoin's three three notches higher than, NAS you know, the NASDAQ 100 index on the wall, right? So, which we've seen too, we've seen correlations of these, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I just looked at a chart that, you know, correlations of Bitcoin to the broad market indexes have risen since COVID, right? So they're moving more in sync, which is a good thing and a bad thing, I kind of think of, right? Yeah, yeah. So like so, the reason anyway. why I put those deflation charts at the beginning, right, is if if the inflation situation gets better faster than the market expects and if when we look at those break-even charts and listen to hilton uh, there's some evidence that 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 might be happening uh, that we should see uh you know crypto shopify these types of kind of high vol um, uh, assets uh rebound right we'll see if that happens i don't know yeah Yep. All right. So here's the one year performance of uh, BTC ETH. Uh, so it's it's the large caps, right, that are holding up a little bit better here. Uh, layer ones down 50. And then the, the more theoretical kind of less cash flowing projects, uh, Metaverse, DeFi, Infra uh, down 70, 80 percent. So we've been focused on on layer ones as the part of the market that appears to have kind of the largest addressable market, right? So the layer ones can take a, a little commission off every transaction that goes across these open source blockchains, whether they're at the application layer or not. Uh, and so the, the addressable market's the biggest, and it also seems like the friction to switch from developers also seems higher in these in these layer ones, right? Devs don't want to code in five different languages with four different software toolkits. They want one, maybe two uh, environments to code in. They want to build their apps on that. ETH is the kind of first port of call, uh, and then you know there's we think maybe five to seven uh, chains that will that will emerge. Um, 
to to rival them, right? And so, uh, right now in in a in a bear market, ETH is outperforming the its competitors in layer ones. But then layer ones are you know pretty significantly outperforming the more uh, longer tail metaverse and, and infra apps. The, it, ETH is in the layer one bucket too, That's right. right? That's right. So right now, ETH uh, is like forty percent of that index. Bartlett's face just disappeared. Love it. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the next slide while I try to fix Bartlett. You can just oh, he's back a little bit. Okay, so here's the one here's the one month. This is the most painful month for crypto uh, in in several years. Uh, there's been really no place to hide. Uh, ETH's down thirty nine, uh, Solana down fifty eight. Um, you know the the one bright spot here is Tron. Tron is now an eight billion dollar market cap. It's up thirty percent. You know this project, JP? Um, I know the name of it. I'm not like uh, super dialed into it. Let's just say that it, it's a it's an Ethereum cut and paste chain, uh, and I mean it, you know it's been very fast moving and adaptive. And so what they did after the Terra um, demise is they launched this new stablecoin USDD, which is an algorithmic dollar pegged stablecoin. And as far as I can tell, it uses pretty much the same mechanism that Terra did. Um, and they started out with this 30% APY. It's now down to, I think, 11% or so. It's just pretty remarkable that the crypto community, you know, faced with a zero from Terra, has then gone and pivoted and put all these all this money into another chain, doing much the same thing. And if you look at who the backers are, like Alameda is a backer of this USDD. So the institutional players are like, hey, let's do this again, right? And I'm like, oh, I don't really want much part of this, but um, it just highlights for me that there's enormous demand in crypto for a decentralized stable coin that can be used in DeFi and cannot be censored. And UST was magnetic for that reason. And they started out with you know, too aggressive a model, the 20% not sustainable. Um, you know, maybe, maybe Tron now down to 11%, maybe it's gonna be a little more sustainable. It still feels kind of high to me, uh, but I just wanted to highlight it that crypto community loves algo stable coins. You know, nothing's gonna stop it. It's the, it's the holy grail. Um, of, uh, of stable coins and it's the holy from what i understand it's the holy grail because it's not controlled by a single point right because that's what you know t tether and usdc they're still owned or controlled by somebody who's supposed to be buying assets when somebody deposits money right and so the risk is you don't want a single point of contact to own to own the own the peg right and, and I guess my question to you is, if you can answer this, do you think the algorithmic stake, do you think Terra was, the, the, what happened to Terra specific to Terra? Like, are you looking at this and set USDD and being like, uh, it's the same thing, maybe the rate's lower. Is this going to happen again here? I mean, obviously, do you see the same risk of this happening here? Or do they need to do something else to the concept of algorithmic stable coins to make it work? Like, are we not there yet? Uh... I think the, the, the there are very similar risks uh, that you know 11 percent is a little bit is more palatable than than 20, but if you really wanted to start an algorithmic stablecoin, you should start with two percent and over collateralize it you know by two x with with Bitcoin or with dollars, uh, and you know there's some there are some algo stablecoins that are kind of doing that under the radar, right? Um, I mean, Dai's not under the radar, but th that peg has has held pretty well. That's that's a decentralized stablecoin, uh, which is over collateralized. So just a uh, a safer version. Um, so we're going to see. Yeah, here here you can see um, the top ten stablecoins and and kind of what's happened to their market cap over the last week. Uh, so and so like you said, like Tether is a centralized kind of whitelisted stablecoin. They're like an ETF sponsor. They have authorized participants who can create and redeem at par and then uh the asset tether also trades on the secondary market uh, but b because of that uh kind of authorized participant model they can blacklist certain entities uh, they can censor you know 
Russian citizens or, or whoever else, and however you know well-meaning and appropriate that may be in certain circumstances, crypto communities dying for a for a for a stablecoin that that cannot Truly be censored, right? right. Um, so here, there you see USDD uh, cracking the top 10 on that list. It's now about a 600 million dollar market cap. Tron market cap is 8 billion. So maybe maybe there's a few more months uh, months here to go. Will Tether break the buck? Yeah, so uh, I guess last week, uh, th this is a daily candle of Tether. Uh, so you can see that there's been plenty of times over the last five years when uh, Tether's traded down to kind of 94, 95 cents. Um, if it happens once, it tends to happen again. The market tends to kind of test it uh, over the subsequent weeks. Uh, so, um, but I think there's a lot that's out of their control, right? Like Tether can't control the value of the commercial paper that they own. That's a function of, of market conditions. Um, and if the, if the stock market and risk assets rally, then the pressure will come off, will come off Tether, I think. The, the other thing that's happening is even as uh, everyone is taking aim uh, at Tether and trying to, trying to, to break the buck, they, they continue to innovate. They just launched a... Mexican peso denominated stablecoin. Um, uh, Tether's now on the Polygon network. Uh, so you have to admire the execution uh, with everyone kind of training their attention on uh, possibly breaking the buck here. The, uh, yeah, I saw. Yeah, so, so saw this, this is like I said, the crypto community is desperate for, for Algo stablecoin. And here's a poll that uh, that Gojo Crypto, he does he or she does good job on uh, on data. And so there's this was a poll on May 10th. Do you think a highly adopted decentralized stablecoin is important? 81% yes. What was the price of uh, UST when this poll was done? Like when did, when did UST crater? Was it after this or before? It, uh, this? UST this crater 10th? before this, so this was a uh, okay. Yeah, this, so this was after it happened. Yeah. So this is May tenth. Uh, UST cratered like Sunday the eighth into the Monday the ninth. By the morning of the tenth, it was worthless. Um, yeah. So here, you, the left hand side is is price volatility for U.S. dollar stable coins. Uh, so big increase in the beginning part of this month as everyone tried to figure out who's next. Uh, and now, you know, things seem, things appear to have stabilized. So uh, there's mar there's a lot of market share to pick up from other stable coins of all that yeah. like uh, activity that that UST used to have. And it's pretty interesting that uh, on the right hand chart there, the on chain volume of stable coins, it's going to make an all time high in May again. Uh, so uh, it's not like people That's are fleeing these things, uh, right? They're using them more than ever. Uh, now you made a comment, JP. You, we should get your mom on here uh, because she. You said she made a like a multi transfers, right? She bought money in Coinbase, then she sent it to Coinbase wallet, sent from there to MetaMask, right? Well, Coinbase just announced the, that they're integrating into MetaMask. So this is the Coinbase Pay, uh, which is essentially a, a bank. I think it's powered on the back end by Cross River, which is Fort Lee, New Jersey based <clears throat> bank. And you will now be able to, your, your mom, JP, will now be able to buy ETH directly from MetaMask uh, by going through Base Pay. And if you look at the number of kind of crypto to fiat on ramps that are uh, being introduced, they're just, it just keeps growing. Uh, and so when the next bull market comes, uh, everyone's going to find it a whole lot easier to move their, their money back and forth. So, is, so is, there's, Meta, yeah. is MetaMask uh, conducting the KYC I when, think, when, when, when bringing folks on or, not, or who is? I don't know the answer to that. I think it's Coinbase Pay because okay. they're the ones with the banking money transfer licenses. Um, that was another step my mom had to do. She she ha she hadn't fo fully uh, verified her identity, so she had to like you know upload her ID and stuff like that. Into, but so there was like an ETH transfer that was like hanging out, you know, and, and then she uploaded her ID and it just went through immediately. Oh, the joys of crypto. I think you know just step. In, like I think that once it's easy for people like my mom and maybe people who aren't you know you know your typical forty year old person that isn't a computer geek like me and I would say everybody on this call is a computer geek, right? Like once it's easy for those people to do it, then it's gonna be even bigger, right? And, and, and the thing is, 
it's going to be underneath, right? It's going to be underneath. It's not going to be like, oh, I'm doing crypto. It's just going to be like, no, I'm just doing the same thing that I'm doing now built on top yep. of crypto. So anyway. All right, yeah, this one we kind of alluded too, yeah. to, right? So just continued momentum in El Salvador, Central African Republic, and um, these, uh, you know, president of both countries, pr pretty active uh, in the evangelist um, uh, function, right? Which is getting other nations, yeah. which may be in similar dire straits to, to get on board with this. Uh, so both the Fed and the ECB both put out surveys this week that uh, give a, a hint of how early it is for crypto. So the Fed says 12% uh, of surveyed adults have used crypto. Only 2% uh, uh, have used it for, for payments. Um, so that's what we're talking about is that 2% is going to grow really fast uh, as these uh, fiat on-ramp integrations occur. Uh, and then the ECB one I, I love because they, they specifically call out in the next slide uh, that most of the adoption uh, is coming from folks at the uh, top end of financial literacy and at the bottom end. So everyone who's been on crypto Twitter knows this mid twit meme uh, appropriate in so many situations. And uh, yeah, I think I see Christine Lagarde right at the top of that uh, in the middle. <laughs> Spell it out. I mean, so let's, I mean, I know it might be like, spell it out for my mom's going to spell it out for my mom. What does this mean? mean? What does this mean? What does this picture mean? Uh, this picture means that, uh, you know, sometimes the, those who may uh, not be as intelligent, like in classical terms, kind of understand like deep down instinctually uh, why something matters. Right. And that's the case with, with Bitcoin, right? You can watch uh, the Campbell's price of soup and what happened starting in 1971, and you can say, huh, something changed here. And I don't need to know the mechanics of the Federal Reserve or like how many hashes go into a Bitcoin to know that uh, like there's a better way maybe. Uh, so, um, and so sometimes the folks who are the most mainstream may miss that uh, because they're too busy yeah. trying to explain every uh, little detail about it. So the ECB, you know, surveyed their uh, constituents, and, and that's exactly what they found, which is the less sophisticated and the most sophisticated love Bitcoin, and the mainstreamers uh, are not quite there yet. Very great explanation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this, yeah, this is I'm, a painful I'm chart, right? I'm very familiar with it. I'm very familiar with this. Now, we're not supposed to talk this, about funds. Yeah, this yeah. is a certain ETF. Uh, this is the year-to-date performance well, of this the is, yeah. equities inside of Index. it. Index. Uh, and exactly. it's just uh, highlighting that Bitcoin miners have been taken out behind the woodshed. Uh, and it, it certainly seems like the market's pricing and some of these are not going to survive, right? So a lot of these companies need additional capital to execute on their plans for Bitcoin mining. They got to go out and buy these uh, ant miners. They have to secure power, a lot of capital that needs to happen. And um, as you'll see from the next chart, this is two estimates of... Bitcoin price versus the cost of production. Um, and in both cases, we're, we're starting to eat into this cost curve, right? So every commodity has a cost curve. And uh, the big guys who can produce at scale will be on the low end of the cost curve, making money at 3,000 per coin, 5,000 per coin. And then you're going to have some idiot hobbyists who mine in their uh, basement with like overpriced electricity and they'll start to realize that like they're not making money and they're going to start to shut off those Bitcoin machines and then we'll learn like how steep is this curve how many of those people are there who are uh, mining Bitcoin that's not economically rational because they see it as a religion or something uh, and those folks you know there's an argument that those folks need to get shaken out they need to sell those ant miners like to buy Campbell's soup cans uh, before before we bought them uh, and we're, we're starting to get there. Uh, next chart, uh, this on the left-hand side is shows the price of uh, an ant miner S19. So it's down from 19,000 bucks to 8,000 bucks in the last six months or so. Uh, the right-hand mm. chart is a is kind of a, a a little profitability matrix from from BTIG. If you if you put in the $8,000 cost per rig, and you map it against the $30,000 Bitcoin. It's a 766-day payback, okay? So that means that in, in about two years, 
you've earned your money back on these machines, assuming um, uh, the appropriate cost of power. Um, but you know, two years is not as good as it sounds, right? Because a lot of these ASICs depreciate. They're they might not work after three years or, or four years or five years. Um, so, uh, you know, especially if we get down into that 20,000 level, you see how many days there, 1,351. Yeah, so that's like four years, yeah. four years of payback. The ASICs themselves like don't break last. even. Yeah, it's kind of break even, not that interesting, right? So, I, I mean, I would yeah. flip it around and say, that's where we can start to look at, at a bottom. Uh, you know, yeah. in, a, in a worst case, you don't always reach it, but uh, you know, that, that just some, some more evidence that we're starting to kind of eat into this cost curve and I would expect supply to, to come offline here if prices don't recover. Now prices could always recover. There's a demand side, right? If another country comes yeah. in and says, we're adopting Bitcoin legal tender, price is gonna moon. Uh, but I just wanna set it from the from the supply side. What are we looking at here? Uh, this is Coinbase's 10-year uh, uh, bond that has a coupon of 3.6%. It's yielding 9.3. So just illustrating that um, debt markets are, are quite pessimistic about uh, about all the companies in, in DAP, right, JP? Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, this is just, yeah. I mean, I find you this know, for, I find for... this, this level of 9.3% is kind of interesting uh, because one of the funds that we're not going to talk about uh, is, a, is a, you know, we, we lend dollars to crypto yeah. intermediaries and uh, that, you know, 9.3% is kind of, that's an interesting level if you look at what what that fund yields as well. And yeah. we think that fund is much safer than, than this where th this is duration right here. you got 10 years at risk. Yeah. Right, and the fund that we're not talking about, it's it's overnight. Uh, so, volatility would be yeah. much lower, lower duration, and we're we're kind of achieving almost that yield. Or sorry, yeah. All right, next one. Yeah. Um, last, just final final chart here. Um, if you remember when Stanley Druckenmiller bought Bitcoin, uh, his, what's what struck him was that people who buy Bitcoin don't don't sell, right? 86% of the people yeah. who bought Bitcoin never so, have never sold, uh, and that's what we see here, which is the percent of supply last active more than a year ago. So Bitcoin untouched for more than a year, making wow. uh, another all-time high. So this is all-time high. Yeah. Wow. That is that you know the is there's another slide that we didn't bring up with the ETH, the ETH um, percent locked total value locked. Does that look similar to this, or is there more ETH unlocked right now? Like, how, what does that chart look like? Yeah, so that? ETH, um, the staking uh, for ETH2 is is not fully functional yet. If you stake on ETH2, the unbonding period will be unknown because until they do the merge, uh, it's possible that you might yeah. have to be locked in for, for six months here. So uh, the percentage of ETH that's staked is, is quite low, still only about 10%. Uh, that number should so begin it's a little, to rise pretty it's a quickly different. once the merge clarifies. Yeah, it's a little different. Got it. It's a little different. Got it. Um, awesome. Well, that was a lot. And I think we did a pretty good job of asking you some questions. Um, Matt, you what? Your your camera disappeared. On I mean, Skype closes on me at least once a, a YouTube show. So, JP, I got to twice this show. Good to see you guys. Hey, Matt Siegel. Final question. Yeah, I got to ask you one question. Lightning round. How, how do you personally feel about the, your, your, the nickname, Seagull the Eagle? How do you feel about that? No good? Or Whatever good? works, man. Well, we've been in the Eagle's Nest. Seagull, okay. thank you very much, well, later, Matt. We had a lot of fun again, and uh, we're going to end it. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And the stream is uh, falling apart as people leave.